our leadership series. Uh, my name is Rick Verbor, and I'm director of our Sample Center for Ethical Leadership in our School of Business and Technology. This event is sponsored by the Sandbolt Center. The center was created through a gift from Minnesota Power to honor its retiring chairman and CEO, Sandy Sandbolt. And we're fortunate to have Mr. and Mrs. Sandbolt with us here today. I'm pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Ron Alston. Uh, he's an executive uh, with Essentia Health here in Duluth. Um, before coming to Essentia a year ago, he spent uh, 35 years with Mayo Clinic uh, in, in a variety of roles. Um, he's also a football coach, and uh, he's, he's an assistant coach for our own Saints football team. So, Ron, welcome, and thanks for meeting with our group. Thank you. So. Well, uh, thank you all for the opportunity. Uh, when I was asked to do this, um, I thought, well, well, first, where'd they get my name? I've only been here about a year and a half. And second, what, are, what is it that I can give to you that you will leave with today? And so, um, and then as far as football, um, it's been great uh, getting to meet some of the guys on the team and coach. And I'm only here one day a week for a few hours, but I'm enjoying every minute of it. And so, the objective today is really for you to leave with one thing that might make a difference in your future. What can I share with you that might leave you, when you leave today, you say, wow, that's something that maybe will help me. And so I'm going to kind of take you on a little bit of a journey, initially with some pictures, but trust me, the whole talk won't be with pictures. But a lot of times you can connect with some of those things. And so I'm going to share that with you. And so I'm going to take you back to where I grew up, where I was born. I was born in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is my elementary school. And it's not very big, but it's in very southern uh, North Carolina. Uh, I was a strict Baptist family. I went to church every Sunday. I was in church from 9 o'clock with Sunday school until about two, and then I left and had to go to my aunt's church who was a Pentecostal minister. So I spent probably, oh, 10 hours in church on Sunday. Let me tell you, um, when I was able to decide whether I wanted to go to church or not, um, I made the choice to not go spend 10 hours there. <laughs> uh, so my parents went through a divorce at that time, and um, and so my mom moved to Washington, D.C. And so we kind of stayed, and my sister kind of really took care of us. And then um, in about fifth grade, I moved to Washington, D.C. We were all together, my mom, my younger brother, and my older sister. And uh, I went, moved from southern North Carolina into really the inner city of Washington, D.C. Okay, so... My very first experience in my new neighborhood was someone wanted to punch me out. So imagine moving into a new neighborhood that your mom is trying to provide for you, and you're like, holy crap, how in the world am I going to survive living here? Because the first experience is somebody <coughs> wants to punch me out. <clears throat> so this is where I went to elementary school. Now, I was five minutes away from my home. You can imagine walking a class across the campus. Maybe it takes you a couple minutes. So it took me about five minutes. Probably half the year, it took me a half an hour to get from school home because I was trying to avoid issues. Okay, and so that happened quite a bit. Made me a little stronger. This is where I went to junior high, and to the left of that is where I grew up playing football. Um, I was just home in Washington, D.C., visiting my, my mom, who, uh, who's in a nursing home at, at this time, um, and noticed that they had changed the name of the school. So my brother and I, we like to kind of drive through all the neighborhoods and kind of just see what has changed, and a lot has changed. And so... Um, um, it was very interesting. I took some really, really poor pictures. But the Washington Nationals, I lived in just um, 
a couple neighborhoods, and some worse than others. And one in particular that I, that I can remember is um, I go to school, I come home, I didn't do much outside. Played football, um, studied. But the Washington Nationals has built this beautiful baseball facility right in the middle of a really bad neighborhood. And to drive by there and see it and see that nothing, I mean, it's, it's immaculate. It's immaculate. So what that told me is, wow, some things have changed here because when I was growing up, it wouldn't look the same way. Somebody would have done something. It's spray painted or, or something, but it, it, was, it was immaculate. So now this is the Maya Angelou PC School, which is um, more arts, which is good. And then my high school, now you go, wow, that looks bad. Well, it looks bad because now they're, this is a deli uh, demolition piece of it. But this was a cool high school, still in the middle of a lot of issues, but it had seven floors, it had escalators. Um, it, was, it was pretty neat. This is the football field that I played on. Now it's changed. It's a new technology school. Okay, so um, they have to have really good grades to stay in it. Um, same neighborhood, built on the same grounds as the school that I went. They have a nice new turf football field. It's immaculate. Same neighborhood, things change. Um, but people have to change to go along with that, right? So we can't live in the same neighborhood and do the same things and expect to be able to survive those types of things and have those nice of things. So then I was being recruited uh, by some really good sized colleges to play football. And um, I was in much better shape. I was really fast. Um, I couldn't catch, but I could hit. So they kind of liked that. So I was getting recruited, but I didn't think I was ready for it. So some nice sized colleges. So I chose to go to a junior college and they had a recruiter in Rock, from Rochester, Minnesota, that recruited out of Washington, D.C. So on August 22nd, 1977, I hopped on a plane with about um, 10 other guys that were all minorities that moved out of different parts of Washington, D.C. to come to Rochester. From the airport into town, there was nothing. Zero. Farms, cows, horses. And at that point, I thought, okay, um, what in the world did we do here? <laughs> so we got into town, met some people, some really nice people, but this was the very <clears throat> first time um, I experienced some adversity, some adversity related to color. Shaped me a little bit. Um, I, I remember calling home to my mom which is probably the best thing um, she's ever done for me, balling. I had just been walking down the street, and um, there were some people that threw cans of, full cans of beer cans at us, and there were some names coming out of there, some I'd never heard, but I heard everything. Um, and I called my mom and said, I can't stay here, I can't stay here. And she said, you went that far, you're going to stay, you're going to learn something from this. That was the best advice that she could have given me. I stayed, I grew, and I grew quickly. Grew quickly. I learned how to make, not that I didn't make good choices then, because I did. I stayed out of trouble when I was growing up. But I learned how to make really good choices after that. Then I left RCTC and I went to the University of Northern Iowa, flat. Um, I'd wake up some mornings to get ready for class and go, well, I can't really see out of the window. I'm not sure if I really want to walk across campus this morning. That's how cold it was there, because it was so flat. But I managed to get there. But I didn't really like their football program. So I went there on a football scholarship after junior college. And ethically, I just didn't like the football coach. There were things about him that morally was against what I thought was the right thing to be teaching kids.
And, you know, he'd come to practice. Now, granted, that's a dome stadium. And he'd be smoking a cigarette, you know. Um, and he just wasn't a nice guy. So I thought, rather than complain, I'm just going to play spring ball, see how it goes. And, and I left. And I left and came back and took a job at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. During that time, I spent about four years of trying to go to different free agent camps. And it got to a point where I had to cash it in <coughs> and say, this is not going to happen. And so this is a little bit of kind of where I started. So this, and you go, boy, this guy's kind of been all over the place and worked a lot of jobs. Well, there's a reason for that. So my first job, I started, I just had my two-year degree, so I hadn't finished my undergrad. And of course, certainly, um, graduate school was not even <coughs> in the picture. And in 1980, I started Mayo Clinic in a very entry-level job. I want to say my first, uh, my salary was about $4.35 an hour. But I loved it, right? And I'll show you a little picture at the end. Um, but first job, worked there for six years, and decided, eh, I want a little more. So I went back and became a surgical tech. Probably the best um, job decision that I had ever made with regards to going back to school to better myself. Because that particular job has been every career move since. Every career move that I have made is centered around that second bullet from the last. Went on to work in the cath lab, and you go, animal research, how does that fit into all of this? Well, it probably was the best job I've ever had. Um, and what it was, it was true research. We were doing uh, pig to baboon heart and kidney transplant. So I was almost like, my, like a doctor. So I worked with the surgeon to make the transplant. And why did we use pigs? Because pig organs are similar to human organs and we're studying the rejection. And so I got to play doctor. I got to learn a lot because once we had transported that organ, it was my responsibility to come in um, at, at, uh, in the morning, on the weekend, put them down. And put them down means to put them to sleep draw their blood, send their blood in, come back in the evening, read their labs, and actually augment their medication based on what their needs were. So it was kind of cool. So it was kind of fun to, to play doctor. But then that kind of got old because it wasn't allowing me to go anywhere. And then this first job I started in ended up coming back to that department as a linen and equipment coordinator. So my boss, who was my boss then, hired me back into a higher position. And why is that? Well, we'll get touch on that a little bit, right? Um, remember that people are always watching you, regardless of what you do. Regardless of what you do, somebody is paying attention to what you're doing and how you're doing it, and it comes back around. Took another risk. This IRB job, worst job I ever had. <coughs> the worst <laughs> job I ever had in my life. Um, I didn't have a very good boss. Um, she didn't allow you to grow. Um, people were always on needles and pins. Uh, matter of fact, that particular job was the cause of me to go get a cardiac echo and some other things. Very stressful, but stressful for the wrong reasons. She just didn't know how to treat people. It wasn't the work, she just didn't know how to treat people. In between there, I went back, got my undergrad, got a management job, and then my last job at Mayo Clinic was the administrator for cardiac surgery. So I was the administrator for the biggest, second biggest cardiac practice in the world. I worked with some pretty bright people, some pretty arrogant people sometimes, but some pretty bright people that cared about patients and the outcomes and how to treat people. And so all of these things that you see have culminated into where I am today. So um, there was a gentleman who was a COO here that worked at Mayo in a different, a lot of different um, sites, um, Jacksonville, Rochester. 
And him and I just kind of always used to tease him. I'd really love to work for you someday. Really love to work for you someday. Just like the way he carried himself. So always I thought I would get a job with him within the Mayo Clinic. And I was sitting at my desk one day, and the phone rings, and it's this guy, right, two years ago. And he says, um, and I answered the phone like I always do, with a bright, cheery, happy, hello, how can I help you? Um, cardiac surgery. Um, and we're having this conversation, him and I, and I still don't know who it is, right? And he goes, you don't know who this is. And he tells me, and he says, well, we might have an opportunity up here for you. I said, okay, I'll go look. He says, if, if, if it's not you, maybe there's somebody that, that you think would be a fit up here. And I said, well, I'm going to look myself, right, before I start offering somebody else up. And full circle, here's, here I am today. Um, not in the same role that I was hired for. Actually, the role that I'm in is a much, much better fit for who I am and my personality. I'm out in the community. I've always given myself to help people. I've been working since I was 13 years old. And so, um, much, much better fit for me. So, what important characteristics uh, for leaders um, do I think we should have? Well, integrity. Integrity is, uh, is high on my list. You guys mind if I take my jacket off? Let's get a little warm up here. Um, high integrity. Loyal. There was a, a surgeon, he's a pretty world-renowned surgeon, he probably does about 420 bypass surgeries a year himself. And I asked him, I said, what are the three things you look for when you're hiring someone? And he says, loyalty, integrity, and accountability. And so I try to keep, hold on to those things. And I didn't understand what loyalty meant. I thought loyalty meant, you know, well, loyalty to him. But loyalty to him meant, if you're going to work with me as a nurse or PA or any of those things that he is leading, then your loyalty be, better be to every patient that he operates on. Right? So sometimes you have to ask questions to get to really the gist of what somebody means. I thought loyalty meant loyalty to the organization. No, he meant loyalty to his patients. And then accountability, and accountability with that, I have two words there, um, accountability and humility. It's important, right? It's important to be able to say, ah, I didn't get it right this time. Maybe next time, right? Because so very easy for me to say, well, you know, I think he forgot to give me a piece of it, which is why I've delayed it. No, no, if he didn't give you the piece of it, make sure you go ask. But it's very, very important to say, you know what, I got it wrong. And I'll share a story with you at the end about that. And then communication. I have this written up on my all over my office. Um, our CEO said this, and it just resonates with me, but unarticulated expectations are seeds that lead to future resentment. Anybody would agree with that? Right? You all are here to get education. You all want to go to class and have a teacher tell you what it is that they expect from you. Right? You don't want to leave thinking, well, what really did they want? kind of creates that gap. So when you come back and take the test, and it wasn't what you didn't ask, you didn't really confirm what it was they're trying to get you to do, uh, you, you don't leave very happy, because that's not what you thought they meant. So ask. It's part of communication. It's very important. Good skill to have. So skills that have helped me succeed in life, and what skills should you develop? And I shouldn't say what skills should you develop, but what skills might be out there that might help you? Well, I think being confident is great, right? People want pe to hire people who are confident. They don't want to hire arrogant people, though. They want to hire people that are confident. And so one of those is really, how do you be confident and not be arrogant? Well, 
Develop soft skills, people skills. They're easy, right? Very easy things to, to, uh, to develop, you know, with each other. Be approachable. Realize you don't know it all. So I really want people that work under my leadership, I want to be a really, really good leader. I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I already know that I'm not. But I want to be a good leader. I want to ask them every time that I have a meeting with them, what do you need from me? What can I do to make you better? So, good example I'll share with you. Just happened 45 minutes ago. One of my team members. So we're in and we're going over. So I went to a meeting in her place yesterday in Deer River. So I was kind of giving her a rundown on what went on. So at the end of our meeting, she said, yeah, I'm going back to grad school. There's this dietitian special thing that I want to do. And I said, great. And I said, so, tell me what that means. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I want to know how I can be thinking right now of how to use that, how to help you use that. So that you can get to the level, you're not going back to grad school to keep doing this, right? She goes, no, but no one's ever asked me that. No one's ever asked me how they can, how can I help them? Soft skill. So as you get out in your field of work, those are soft skills that are right there for you. People want to know that you care about them. When I took this new job, I sent out a questionnaire with five questions. First question was, tell me about you and your family. Had nothing to do with what, they, what their work was. Everything was focused and centered around them. And so now when they come, every once in a while, I'm horrible with names. I think I should have said, give me a number for each kid. I'd probably remember that a little bit better. But I try to ask how their kids are doing. If they're in athletics, I try to remember one thing. It goes a long way. Surround yourself with good people. Always. Um, I've had two guns pointed to my head. Point blank range. One when I was in eighth grade. One was when I was a junior in high school. The one, both were in schools. Okay? Lucky. I'm just, God's been good to me. But... I've always surrounded myself with good people. I never hung out with bad people. Now, I've hung out with people who did some bad things, but they weren't intentional. Surround yourself with good people. Be accountable. If you mess up, say it. Just say it. Be open about it. Be respectful. Right? Sometimes that's hard to do because they're just people we just don't like to be around. We all have that, but be respectful. Smile often. I, I had a, uh, a doctor one day, I was coming to work um, when I was at, in Rochester, I was coming to work and the guy said, what is wrong with you? That's what he said, he asked me that, flat out. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're always happy. Why are you so happy? I said, well, why not be? You know, I got to come to work and take care of people. We should be happy. I'm happy. I just got to get up and breathe. And, and, um, and so I said, well, maybe it should be a little bit contagious. You know, you should catch some of this. <laughs> and uh, he didn't have a comment about that. <laughs> be competitive. Right? We got lots of people in this room that are competitive, whether you're in a sport or you're in um, a club, or be competitive, but don't make it contentious, right? There's a way to be competitive, and there's a way to be passionate, and then there's a way to shut it down, right? It's a way to shut it down, to say, ah, okay, you know, I'm not, I am mad at you, but I guess I'm not that mad at you that I need to go home with this today. So find a way to, find a way to shut it down. So what attributes of the company 
um, have helped me be successful. Now, when I think of coming, I spent 30, 30, five years at the Mayo Clinic, so I only really know one company, except I do know this company, which is a great company um, that I've come to in the last year and a half. But the biggest thing that I've got, and the thing that you want to look for, particularly when you start going out into the work field, is just like your home, you know, I had another, I, everything with me is very practical. It's just practical, you know. What would I do at home or wouldn't do at home, I probably shouldn't do it at work, right? You know, I'm not going to go home and yell at my wife every day and then come home and or come here and not yell at her and then think I can do it at work, right? You, you, just don't, you just don't do those things. So healthy culture. You want to surround yourself in a place that creates a culture that's healthy. Now, I don't know what that looks like for you. It might look <coughs> different for all of you, you know, but to me, it was good relationships, collaboration, being able to pick the phone up and say, hey Rick, boy, I really need your help right now and I know you have the skill set to help me with this. Now, first of all, Rick wants to help me now. It wasn't that I just picked up the phone and said, hey Rick, I need your help. I said, Rick, you have a skill set that I need and I know you're good at it. Well, most people are gonna jump to help somebody when you tell them you give them a compliment about what it is that they're doing. Builds good collaborative relationships. Allows for growth opportunities. You want to work somewhere where you're acknowledged for the work that you're doing and that you have an opportunity to grow. As you can see on my early, earlier slide, I had a lot of opportunities to grow. I had exceptional mentors. Not just mentors, exceptional ones. Some that I still talk to today. And so I make it a point to really, really, really try to mentor my teams. Try to mentor my teams really, really well. Um, it's important. Um, and a lot of times, my staff will come to me with stuff that's completely unrelated to work. It's like, well, I had one this morning. I have my 13-year-old daughter. And I said, oh, yeah, well, that's going to be all year. <laughs> I said, because let me tell you what my daughter said to me when she was 13. She told me she hated me. And I said, what would your answer be? And she goes, I don't know how to handle that. What would you say? I said, get used to it. You're going to hate me a lot more. <laughs> right? So we kind of, they kind of, we have to not overthink things and, and get people around us that can help us kind of talk and work through those things. See it from a different lens. And then roadblocks. Yep. Every organization you go to, you're going to have that roadblock. You probably have them right here, right? You get up and you go, ah, I thought it was going to be this and it's this. But they are helpful. You have to take a positive with them. It's negative at the point at the time. But there's something positive behind everything that doesn't look good. There's something back there. There's something hidden. You have to find it. You have to look for things to be better. And then always put yourself around people that care. Always. Now I have this, this my, my cardiac surgeon partner, he, uh, well, he's, he's got a lot of Italian blood in him. He's wound up and he is just, sometimes I just have to go close my door because it's like, Okay, I can't get that wound up. I don't know how he does it. But he trusted everyone. He just trusted everyone. He believed that everyone was good. And, and one day, um, he lost his partner. So he lost his partner. He's a uh, uh, world-renowned pediatric surgeon. He's, him and his partner have been working together, and they're going to be together for a long time. And his partner just up and said, I'm going to go somewhere else. Kind of left him. So he's the only pediatric surgeon now for a year by himself. Busy practice. <coughs> and he couldn't understand it. And I said, well, he goes, well, what, what, you know, why would he do that? And I said, well, first of all, you can trust people, right? We all have to take risks and trust people. 
I said, but your circle of trust has to be much smaller. Right? You gotta be able to hold it in your hand. They gotta mean as much to you as your kids and your spouse and loved ones, right? So that's a very, very small circle. And I said, you get outside of that too far. He uses that today, he tells me, but I don't know. So personal responsibility. Um, these are things that I think are, are, are very important. And, and um, you know, it's not what happens that determines, you know, any part of your future, because what happens happens to all of us. It's what you do about it, right? It's what you do about it. So we all kind of have our ups and downs. We all kind of um, go through good things and bad things and highs and lows. But it's not woe me, right? Because the person next to you has probably got something worse. They just aren't acting it out the way you are. So kind of deal with it. it. It happens to all of us. <coughs> Practice the golden rule. Treat others with respect, dignity, and value diversity in all people, right? Not everyone in this room looks alike, and if everyone in this room did look alike, everyone has differences. They come from a different religious background. They come from a different um, culture. They come from a different... There are all sorts of... Think that's okay. It gives me a chance to take a sip of water. So value that, right? You got, you got people in your class and, and um, maybe they're good at something that, better at something that you, you wish you were good at. You know, use it. You know, talk to them. Most people like you to ask them questions about things. You know? Um, so value your classmates. Value your teammates. Value your teachers. Value the administration, right? There's somebody in here that's keeping the lights on. Outside of your tuition that you pay, there's other things that go into making sure that, like the guy that's out here, making sure that you got a clean place to, to, to walk. Those people are important. And we, we tend to walk out the doors and walk past those individuals. But those individuals make a huge difference. When your parents come to bring you something and you're walking into this nice, clean, beautiful building. All right? We don't think about that stuff. I try to think about that every once in a while. Not as often as I should. Um, value each other's differences. I talked a little bit about that. Encourage open communication. So I made this file um, with one of my work groups. And um, I put a coffee card in it. So a $50 <coughs> coffee card. And it was a resolution folder. And it was red. And you know how you know you get people who they come to your death to your door and they knock on the door and they go, "Well, Jesse over here has just really been difficult to work with." Okay, well, all right. But nobody else comes and talks to me about Jesse until that per same person comes back and tells me that Jesse's a problem. And I said, "Wait, well, talk? I can't talk to him." I said, "Well, what do you want me to do?" I can pull you to it in the top. Uh, I said, well, why are you here? And so I said, well, I got an idea for you. Why don't you and Jesse get off of the premises of where we work and go over to the Caribou Coffee. Here's a card, and you guys can talk it out. Two things happen. Either they do it, and they come back happy, or they realize that, ah, I guess I don't have that big of a Right? <laughs> Best thing I ever read was that resolution folder because it did, it did two things. It did two things. Never did it let me down. I mentioned earlier during the talk that um, people around you are always observing, observing you. It's true. It is so true. Trust me. When you leave the building every day and walk across the parking lot and you're eating a candy bar and the wrapper somehow hits the slips out of your hand. Someone saw it. That might be the person that's going to hire you.
So I had to drive to North Dakota um, this weekend. Um, <coughs> painful trip. Um, <laughs> Mayville, North Dakota. Anybody ever been to Mayville, North Dakota? Yeah, painful. Very painful trip. Okay? It was a painful football game, too, to watch. So it was just bad all the way around. Um, but one of the fathers who has a son on the football team lives in that area, Holly, Minnesota. And his son is a senior, but two years ago, he was working a summer job. And some guy, and he was doing some construction stuff. And some guy said, hey, um, we need to dig that hole out more, you know, jump in there and work on it. So kid, you know, he's doing what he's told to do. So he goes in there. The foreman comes out and wants to know, why is he, why are you in there digging that hole out with your hands? Well, those guys told him, they were all laughing and joking about it. The next year, so the, the, the owner of the company heard about this, right? And said, we need to offer this guy a job and not digging holes, right? And then he had to say, well, I've changed my degree from engineering, now it's business, and, and, um, and I'm not done for two years anyway. Guess what? He graduates this year, and he's going to have a job in that company. Why? Because he went in, and he was digging that hole with his hands, little things. Now, why didn't all these other guys that were standing around laughing at him, right, making fun? Somebody's watching you. Always do the right thing. Always have a professional behavior, regardless of whatever you're doing. Now, I'm not perfect. Don't get me wrong. I, I get grumpy every once in a while, but it's far less than I'm happy. I'm happy all the time, um, as much as I can be. Um, but part of that is I spend 20 minutes a day in the car, right? So I drive from Hermantown to work. And I've been doing this for about a year, and it's changed my life. And I think I'm safe to say this in a Catholic school <coughs> and organization. But um, so I was in church one Sunday, and the minister said, "You know, you should just spend time alone, right?" And so for the last year and a half, I get up in the morning, I read my daily devotion, I put it in my phone so I can remember. Okay, well, it's not me controlling what's going on, so I have to kind of come back. And I pray for 20 minutes every day, from the time I get my car from the garage to the time I get to the parking garage downtown. And for some reason, I always thought I was really a good guy, but I think I'm a much better person now. I get to spend some quiet time. I haven't quite figured out what it's doing for me yet, but it's doing something good, and I know that because I feel it. And you have to be engaged in everything that you do, right? Try to be engaged. It's important because those of us that hire people, um, we know when you're not. So make sure, that, make sure that you are. And if you're not, figure out why you're not, and then maybe that's not where you're supposed to be. You're in the wrong place. So, now, I was told this is, uh, this is kind of some ethics here, and, and, um, but I, was, I don't like to talk about myself, but I do like to share things um, with people that hopefully um, they can take something from it. But from dealing with eth ethical dilemmas, yeah, I've dealt with them, um, and you will um, when you leave. If you haven't already, to some degree, you will. Um, but develop really, really, really good values. And don't just stay with them. If somebody tries, if you develop good morals and good values, and someone tries to get you to deviate from it, then you don't want to be there. Right? Because it's going to get worse. So make sure you develop good values and don't waver from them. Don't lose sight of where you started. Right? So today, if I were to go back to the Mayo Clinic, and there were people still working in the area where I started, and there are, I make sure I go stop and talk to them. 
That's where I started. I'm not any better than them. I just told, chose to go back and get my undergrad and go back and get my graduate degree so that I can do more, just do more. But I'm no better than they are. Seek all sides. Seek to see all sides. Every day somebody is pulling at me to make a decision about something and everybody's got a story of why they should have it that way. Right? If you pick up a book and open it up and it only talks about one particular thing in the book, the whole book, chances are you're going to sit it down. There's got to be two stories to it. There's two sides. That's the whole beauty of it. Right? So you can understand what they're trying to get you to think about. Gather your facts. Very important. Extremely important. So, something didn't go right in class. And you're going to go talk to the teacher about it. Got to make sure you have your facts because they're going to have theirs. Right? So make sure you do your homework. Do your homework. I have an employee right now. She's awesome. But she reacts to stuff. And so we were just talking today. Matter of fact, we just had the conversation in the car yesterday. I was on my headset talking to her as I was driving from Deer River. And we kind of have this plan of how we're going to attack this issue that we have. And so today she was in my office. And I said, didn't we just, didn't we just talk about that yesterday? Well, yeah, I had a conversation. I said, okay, you have to slow down, right? And I use practical stuff. So I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. I gave it to in a different way. I said, we're going to build the house. We're building the house. So I'm going to go talk to the architect, which is a meeting that I already have set up to go talk to this guy to help us with this problem. And I said, and you're going to go figure out what size rooms we need by doing some research with some other organizations. Resonated with her. It's like, oh, wow. No different than the conversation we had yesterday, except I just put it in a different context. You can kind of see the picture, right? Instincts are good. Believe in it. If your gut's telling you not to do something, it's probably right. Don't do it. Somebody's watching. You're going to get caught. And it might be good, it might be bad. Just don't do it. If it's telling you that, man, this is important to me and I really, really, really feel like this is the right thing to do? Probably is. Do it. <coughs> there was one here that I have to share with you that happened to me. Um, so when I got this job within this cardiac practice, one of the reasons why I got the job is because I'm good with people and I'm good with solving problems or helping people work through it. <coughs> but I wasn't good with this particular one. And so um, <coughs> One of my direct reports had an employee who um, was written up on corrective action. And the employee appealed the corrective action, which means that the appeal was sitting on my desk, that I needed to read it and then get it to HR. And, and well, I had never done an appeal before. So it sat there. It's so like seven days before, right? You have 21 days, seven days before it's due. I'm going, well, what's going on with this? Well, it's sitting on my desk. So my boss now said, send me all the paperwork. And I was going to a state, uh, state tournament game, boys basketball, to watch. And the whole time I'm going, oh, this is not going to be good Monday. It's just not going to be good Monday. Because my boss had set up a meeting for myself and my direct report to meet. And he thanked the direct report you know, for all the work that he, he says, this is great, you did a perfect job, yada, yada, yada. And he's not looking at me. So then he asked him to leave the room. And he left the room and he proceeded to just let me have it. This is why we heard you and you made this mistake and you, you know, and he just beat me up a little bit. And I just sat there and listened. And so when he got done, I said, well, are you done? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I don't have anybody else to blame for, for this but me. <clears throat> I said, so, rightfully so, I deserved everything that you just gave me. I said, the one thing I can promise you is that I'm going to make another mistake, but it won't be this one. He got back to his desk 
20 minutes later, recap that discussion, that what went on. And the one thing that I remember about that email that he sent was, I just want to thank you for being a stand-up guy. I didn't put it out there to say, well, you know, here's why I didn't do it. I just said I didn't do it. Be accountable. So what does your next move look like? Well, here you are now, right? We're walking the halls and have our books and doing our thing. And there are days like this, right? Probably at time when you're taking finals and crunching and and then there are days like that. In the library and it's like, eh, why am I here? Boy, I should have just got a job right out of high school. You know, well, all those things. And then you get to this point, right? Hats flying and everybody's happy. And you have forgot the worst days you've had in college already, right? Then you get out into the corporate world and you start working. And you enjoy life and maybe you meet someone and you have, get married and you have a family. But it all ends, <coughs> right? <laughs> right? So the cycle repeats itself. So it's like, oh, uh, you know, I'm in school and frustrated and, and it's the same thing. Right? It's, it, happens, it happens wherever you are, right? So you get to work and, you know, at some point you grow old, you hope to grow older and, and, um, and be able to have a very viable, successful life. But you know what? There's still those stressful times. It doesn't go away because we get older, right? It happens. So, I'll end. With, this is my very first job at the Mayo Clinic. So that very first job that I had, that's me. I was much better looking then, I think. That was in 1980. This is the job that I ended with after 34 years. All of those guys are cardiac surgeons. Half of them world-renowned cardiac surgeons. So a very prestigious group. I felt honored to be a part of that group. I learned a lot from them. They learned a lot from me. They're always up here. They're very smart, very bright, but they're not very practical thinkers, right? They always want to challenge everything. Tell them to do something. Uh, we're cardiac surgeons. They're not going to mess with that. Well, yeah, they are. Yeah, they are, right? So I appreciate... Uh, you guys given me this time. I hope that this was beneficial to you. I've enjoyed doing it. Um, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that you have, if you have any. Any questions for Ron? Oh, come on, somebody's got to have something. I have a question for you. You talked about being an athlete, being involved in athletics, sounds like most of your life. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more because I know there's a lot of athletes in the room. What impact that had on you personally and maybe even in your career development? Okay. So, um, there's something, thank you. So, the question was um, my experience of being involved in athletes and athletics and um, what impact has that had on me and my life? Well, first of all, if you remember um, what I said earlier, I came from a single family home. So it's just my mom, right? So the one thing that I needed to make sure is, is that I was somewhere that she didn't have to deal with, not just being a single parent, but also dealing with me being stupid and doing something that I shouldn't be doing. So sports was my avenue to that. We were competitive in everything. We didn't, the guy, I was talking to a buddy of mine that I, um, that I went to high school with here about a month ago, a buddy of ours died, so we were talking, and uh, I said, how did we stay out of trouble? And he says, because we were competitive. Hide and seek was competitive. <laughs> right? 
dodgeball. Whatever we did was competitive, which kept, kept us out of trouble. So I stayed in sports because, one, it kind of kept me grounded. Two, it kind of helped me understand what it is to be on a team. Unless all of you in this room decide that I don't even know what job you can have that you work on anymore. All of you are going to be on a team somewhere. That's kind of what, um, what sports has done for me. It's just allowed me to really work with people. Now, there are different <coughs> things along the way that have helped me. I've taken all kinds of Myers-Briggs and colors classes that tells me how to deal with different personalities. These 10 surgeons that I showed you here, each one of them, I had to learn how, if I had a message, the same message to deliver, I had to learn how to deliver it different to each one of them. Some, they want you to give them a whole story. Some, they wanted bullets. Some, just tell me to do it. So I had to figure out different personalities. That's what being in athletics and being on a team has allowed me to do is I can't talk to everyone the same. You know, Coach is here. I'm sure Coach knows that there are certain players that he has to talk to one way and then talk to another one a different way. Same message. That's just knowing, it's just knowing the people. Anything else? Yeah, it's kind of, wow, I expected to just get... You know, we, we have a, a variety of majors here, but mm -hmm. uh, we have quite a few from the School of Business and Technology. Um, are there a lot of opportunities for them in healthcare? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, business is, so my, ma my master's is in healthcare administration, so basically it's a business degree to some degree, just focused on, on healthcare. So, um, I know this isn't right, but I have to say it because I, I, I do believe it. Um, people, many of you are going to get a degree in something, whatever it is here. Probably, chances are, half of you will not end up doing that work. You'll end up doing something that's completely taking you to where your heart has told you to go. So, there are all sorts of opportunities from a business perspective in healthcare. Um, healthcare is a business, and so um, they need good, talented um, people who understand business. So yes, um, I don't see that changing either. Ron's going to meet with our pre-med students in a few minutes in uh, BWC 244, so if you want to meet with them there. Um, um, we'll do that in a few minutes. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, thanks.